Welcome back. Uh, my name is Kevin Tokoff. Uh, make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. This video is going to be on a topic called polarization. And we're going to first kind of go into the theory behind it. What is it? Um, how is it used? Um, and depending on, there's different contexts in which you might be watching this. If you're watching this in the context of organic chemistry, um, there are certain things you need to get out of it. You can also look at it in the context of physical chemistry. I'm going to put it in that playlist as well. And if you're in the, in the class of organic, um, the mathematics in the next few videos, don't worry about it so much. Worry about the conceptual part of it. But there's going to be a little bit of um, a very tiny amount of math in here. Um, but just focus on the concept. All right. So to illustrate what polarization is, okay, we have to have a good example. And the classic example of this, and I'm going to use a biological application here, is in an enzyme active site. And the enzyme active site I'm going to choose to look at is one that's called myosin ATPase. All right. So what is that? Well, that's actually a contractile protein in uh, your muscles that results ultimately in movement of the whole uh, muscle fiber, and that produces muscle contraction. And when you're looking at the myosin enzyme, okay, this is, let me get the right brush, myosin ATPase, okay, as the name suggests, what it's going to do is it's going to take adenosine triphosphate and water, and it's going to hydrolyze it into inorganic phosphate and adenosine diphosphate. Okay, that's the net reaction of this enzyme, myosin ATPase. What I'm going to do is look at the active site, and I'm not going to look at the reaction. I'm actually going to look at ultimately what causes the reaction to occur in the first place as it does. Now, ATP is a very large molecule, okay? It's energy currency in biological systems. I'm only going to look at the triphosphate moiety of it. You're to assume that over on this side, this is where adenosine is. If you want to look at that structure, we have videos on it, and you can certainly Google it. But this is the triphosphate moiety of ATP. Now, polarization is something that, in general, does not occur in a vacuum. Okay, what does that mean? Okay, well, if you look at overall the structure of ATP, okay, the triphosphate moiety has overall a, four, a negative 4 or 4 minus charge, okay, meaning that there's a negative charge distribution over the following atoms, okay, and those are this oxygen, this oxygen, this one, this one, that one, that one, and this one. There's seven oxygens in that triphosphate moiety that all bear some degree of negative charge. Okay? And actually, if you wanted to find out in a vacuum how much each possessed, what you would do is you just take the total charge, which is minus four for the whole triphosphate moiety, and just divide by the number of oxygens, which is seven. And what you get is approximately negative 0.57. Okay, and that's in units of the fundamental charge E. Okay, so it's negative 0.57. Okay, and that's also because there's resonance here, but we're not con con considering that. Okay, in general, if you take this in a vacuum, all of those oxygen atoms should possess the same degree of negative charge, which is negative 0.57. But in reality, when you put this molecule, particularly this triphosphate, in the active site of an enzyme, there's a process of polarization that occurs, and what is that? Well, notice the yellow ones and blue ones I've indicated, they have this charge of negative 0.57E, okay? However, we know, hopefully, from if you've taken general biology or something like that, that when you have an active site of an enzyme, um, there's amino acids that the enzyme puts in very, 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 very close proximity to the substrate, and ATP is the substrate. This amino acid right here, this is the amino acid lysine, abbreviated LYS. Lysine has in its functional group an amine, and it's protonated in the active site, an amine that sticks out towards the triphosphate. Okay. Notice that the amine is technically an aminium, an aminium, in the sense that it's protonated, and it has a positive charge. Now, this is a little bit of physics here, okay? I'm not going to go into any, like, calculations of any kind. But when you have a charge, such as a full positive charge in the case of this lysine R group, 
Charges produce electric fields. Okay? And what do electric fields produce? Forces. Okay, so we have this we have this experience, hopefully, that if you were to take two charged species, right? If you were to take a positive charge and put it in close proximity to a negative charge, they attract each other, and there's a tendency for them to move towards one another, right? We also hopefully have an intuition. If you take those same two charges, one positive and one negative, and you put them one inch from one another, they attract very strongly. However, if you take the positive charge, put it on one end of the room, take the negative charge and put it on the opposite end of the room, very far away from each other, they don't seem to really interact at all, do they? Because they're very far apart. Well, it turns out that the degree to which they interact is described by the electric field. And the electric field is given by Coulomb's constant times the charge of the first particle divided by the square of the distance between them. If I take that electric field due to one particle and multiply it times the charge of the second particle, I get the force of the first particle on the second particle, and that's Coulomb's constant times the first particle's charge times the second particle's charge divided by the square of the distance between them. What does that imply? Well, it implies that it implies that if you stick two charged species in close proximity to one another, they attract each other or repel each other more. And if you put them far away from one another or farther away, relatively, they attract or repel each other less. Well, it turns out that enzymes use this to their advantage because they'll stick charged amino acids in very close proximity to a substrate in order to elicit a change in the electronic distribution of the substrate. In order to do that, I want to use a pretty simple analogy. All right. So you, uh, you know, hopefully by now, that oxygen is a very electronegative atom. Okay, Phosphorus is certainly inferior to oxygen in that regard. So we know that there would be dipole moments if I have any oxygen-phosphorus bond. So an oxygen-phosphorus bond. We know, hopefully by now, that the dipole moment points in the direction of the oxygen. Oxygen is more electronegative. Therefore, the oxygen should have what we call a partial negative charge. The phosphorus should have a partial positive. We know that, hopefully. Well, what that is a result of is the oxygen pulling electron density away from the phosphorus. However, if I stick something else in the presence of that molecule, I can distort it even further. Okay, so here's what I want to show you. In the active site of this enzyme, this is a perfect example and you'll see why, the lysine is closest to this phosphate. This is the gamma phosphate. This one's the beta, this is the alpha, okay? In other words, the lysine's closest to the gamma, moderate in closeness to the beta, and distal from the alpha. Which means that, because of what we just talked about, if they're closer, they affect each other more, there should be more of an effect on the gamma phosphate, less of an effect on, a, on the beta, and we really want to consider the alpha because it's too far away, right? So I've drawn this pretty much to scale the way it is, right? Well, this nitrogen has a positive charge, and it's emitting a positive electric field. That means that all the electrons in the triphosphate should, to some extent, be attracted to that positive charge. So notice, I'm in these blue, light blue arrows, I'm sort of indicating, ultimately, the direction that the electrons are being pulled. The length of the arrow, like any vector, is indicating the strength by which they're being pulled. So notice, they're being pulled towards the oxygen atoms, right? Okay, but notice in the gamma phosphate, the arrows are longer, and that's because they're closer to the nitrogen of the lysine. So the electric force of that positive charge on those electrons is stronger. Therefore, the electrons are going to be farther towards the oxygen atoms. Okay, in the beta phosphate, they're a lot farther away than the gamma phosphate. So notice they're still going towards the oxygen, the electrons that is, but the arrow I've drawn is smaller to indicate that the force is, is diminished because it's farther away. In the alpha phosphate, we're really not considering that much at all. The force isn't really considerable there, so very small arrows, okay? So what would you expect between the beta oxygens, and by the way, I'm gonna box those, the beta oxygens, if you compare those to the gamma oxygens, which oxygens would you expect to have more negative charge? Which ones? Well, 
if the gamma phosphate has oxygen closer to that positive amino acid, then there should be more force pulling the oxygen, the electrons towards the oxygen atoms in the gamma phosphate, so they should be more negatively charged. And that's actually what's observed. Notice these red oxygens. They have now they've switched from in a vacuum from negative 0.57 e to negative 0.9. Okay, so a very large change in electronic distribution. The beta phosphate is also affected. Notice in the vacuum, again, negative 0.57, and it's going to be affected to a lesser extent, but it's going to be negative 0.82. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of sense of the power of putting charged species in the presence of another species. Case in point, an enzyme's active site. Okay, now what is the purpose of this? Well, this is the process of polarization, okay? Polarization, if I had to define it, is basically the process or phenomena by which the electronic nature of one molecule affects the electronic distribution of another molecule when they're in close proximity, okay? If that lysine was 100 miles away from the triphosphate for whatever reason, it's really not going to affect it, right? But if you put them in very close proximity, like it is in the active site, then the positive charge here can distort the electronic distribution of the atoms in the triphosphate, and that ultimately, in the context of biology, promotes some reaction to occur, okay? And I actually did my seminar um, when I graduated with my degree on this very topic, and this is the process of polarization, okay? And it turns out that what we'll discuss in a couple of videos or the next video is that certain atoms have a, the more capacity to be polarized. And it's going to turn out that larger atoms are the ones that have more capacity, and we'll talk about why that is. And polarization is the process by which this occurs, where you put them in close proximity, electronic distributions are distorted. But the capacity to have polarization is called polarizability. And when you're looking at organic, that's a term you're going to hear a lot, polarizability. So polarizability is the ability, if you have great polarizability, it means there's, there's essentially more ability to move electrons to different regions of the electron cloud around an atom. Well, what does that? Size is one thing. Another thing that we'll do it is resonance. But certainly when we're talking about polarizability, we're talking about the size of the atom and the volume that the electrons are able to occupy if, if something was applied to force them around, okay? as in this case, like the lysine residue. All right. So that's what we're going to do with that. Um, ultimately, we're going to resume with um, ultimately polarizability in the next video, but hopefully this gave you a sense of what polarization is. Okay, um, hope this video helped. Make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel for future videos. Um, please come back and see us. Thank you.